So uh, what, what I wanted to do in the, in the round two uh, was to describe uh, four perspectives on, on intergenerational mobility. Uh, I should say at the outset, the, uh, you know, these, these are going to you know, each be you know, formal models uh, of uh, various degrees of plausibility. And, uh, and, and, they, and, they're, and they are used to interpret uh, the sorts of facts I described in the first lecture. I, at the, my objective is both is kind of to put these things on the table. There'll be a little bit of overlap with the previous talks in the sense that some of the models have been articulated in some form or another, but uh, hopefully uh, a slightly different perspective won't won't be unhealthy. And so, in particular, what I wanted to do was uh, I'm going to talk about the, I, for, uh, the, the literature as I read it falls into four categories. Uh, the first is. Um, family investment income models. And what I mean by that, these, these are models that assume that, uh, that the, uh, the agent by which mobility is affected is the parent and the relevant variable really is income. And so behaviors are derivative from this scalar, uh, or, or, or you know, really are, are driven by this in some unobserved heterogeneity. And this type of work, uh, it's still, it, it, these types of models really still are the workhorse of, uh, of most intergenerational mobility work in economics. And it's a fair statement. Uh, and, but I'll make some comments about where I think there, you know, there may be some, some limits. Uh, the second I'm going to only spend a couple of minutes on uh, because this is what Jim talked about. And that is what I'm going to call skills models. And these models, in my mind, actually should be regarded as a, a distinct class. In other words, this isn't Becker Tomes souped up. This is actually a different way to model intergenerational mobility. And uh, but since the guts have already, uh, you know, the, the big idea is already on the table, I just want to give a uh, make you adjust it. Oh, but we can have a look back. <laughs> okay, is that better? All right. Okay, I'll shout. Uh, third models I'm going to call neighborhoods models, and that's just going to be my shorthand for models that in which there's going to be something social about the transmission process. Uh, I'm going to describe, a, the, I, I, this is not with false modesty. The, the best work on this is work by Roland Benabou, who uh, in a series of papers analyzed um, spillover effects in neighborhoods and you know, when, uh, when stratification could be supported by prices, price differentials and the like. However, uh, in usual self-serving fashion, I'll describe a model I wrote, which uh, uh, will have one virtue, which is it's, uh, it'll look mathematically very similar to the first model. And so we can see what the, uh, what the conceptual differences are between the two. Uh, the third model, final thing I'll do is I want to make uh, a very brief, or, uh, go over basic ideas in behavioral genetics. And so, you know, uh, the issue there is obviously we're thinking about you know, parents and offspring. Uh, unless you t one takes the stance that genes don't matter, this has to be something that's on the table. It was emphasized, of course, earlier that the d idea that it's genes and the versus the environment, that all of that is kind of a poor way to think. But nevertheless, there's some, you, what I want you to be aware of is how people have done these calculations. I'd like you to see why I think I could win a debate that they're bad calculations. And, uh, and then uh, I'll at least uh, I'm, I'm not going to have a particularly optimistic answer because I don't think we have a good language right now for, for measuring genetic influences. And so, but it's something I think one has to acknowledge may matter. All right, so family investment models. These are usually associated with uh, uh, two papers. One is by Gary Becker and Nigel Tomes, and the other is by Glenn Lowry. And they, as I said, are the workhorse of most uh, applied theory work on intergenerational mobility. And these models are going to have a very specific way of thinking about what it is that drives mobility. And the virtue is that, uh, th is that they're, they're very clean, and you can sort of understand exactly what's going on. Of course, that will lead to the question as to whether they're rich enough to capture the mechanisms that we think are in play in particular contexts. So comment number one is these are not a sociologist's dream. <laughs> in other words, the vision of the economy in these models is that you have a collection of families that are each evolving independently of each other. <laughs> and so the family is going to be the entire locus of, uh, of activity. 
Now, there's this one sense in which I, w one could relax that. In other words, I could allow a market-determined wage with respect to the human capital, but it's going to miss, uh, miss stuff that, may, that, uh, that one might think is might important. All right. And so the thought experiment is, I, again, I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of give, give you what the, really what drives the models, and I'll tell you what the algebra is. Okay. <laughs> The models all ha have the following logical structure, and that is that they're based on overlapping generations, uh, 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 demography, and, and what that means is that uh, there's a collection of family dynasties. There's I of them. Uh, it's of no importance whether I is finite or infinite. That's what it means to say that there's no social structure or anything going on. It's just there's a bunch of families evolving. And the, popu the demography with respect to a family is, is, the, tri is the trivial standard, tri it's the, the simplest overlapping generation model, which is that individuals live two periods. One period is you're a child, the other period you're an adult. And uh, just to keep the notation straight, when I refer to variables, the T with respect to an actor is when they were born. Uh, and uh, the, these models are not fun. There's uh, asexual reproduction. So these are literally, uh, you know, there's a, there's a question as to whether you should use he or she in papers. Every overlapping generations model of this type really has to use she because uh, <laughs> there, there is no role for, uh, uh, for males in it. I, I, no comment on whether that should be generalized. Uh, but the serious point is that one of the things the model obviously cannot capture are issues of assortative mating. And furthermore, the... Uh, this is, you might know, say, and you know, ruling out uh, the, the fact that uh, people pair up to reproduce. That's what preserves the individual family dynasties as interpretable objects. Obviously, once I have a population which is intermarriage, you have to start to ask the questions differently. And there's been surprisingly little attention to that, at least in economics. But let me leave that aside. Okay, so. The, the model is literally going to only have one choice that's made by one, uh, in life, and agents in some sense are, are passive most of the time. And the way that I want, we want to think about that is that, uh, remember, without intermarriage, or I, you know, I have these, these dynasties that are evolving uh, in parallel to each other. And um, the way that it works is that when I'm a child, the only thing that happens to me is I receive, well, what happens to me is I receive an, an, an educational investment from my parents, some ICT. Okay, so I'm dynasty I of the Durloffs. C, I'm a child, and T is the, the period I was born. All right, now the investment is assumed to then transmit late into, uh, into an actual level of education. That's going to be realized human capital, and the idea is going to be that um, given the investment in me, my actual education is going to depend on something. It'll depend on the investment, and it's going to depend on the shock zeta, and that's going to be unobserved heterogeneity across children. So this is when I said, I can't say what the unobserved heterogeneity is and where it shows up. This is typically where people build in some notion of uh, of ability. So the idea is that children, this is the, you know, and this is where the, you get this genes environment dichotomy that's very tough. Is there's something called ability, and that's distinguishing the kids. Okay, for the purpose of this model. Uh, I'm going to assume that the parents know the ability at the time of investment. Is that of any importance? Actually, no. Uh, obviously, if I was r r analyzing data, I would have to account for the information assumption. It's just going to make life easier to say the parents know it. And, uh, and so the realized education is derived by that function. The reason I want to make the information assumption is when I talk about the decision problem of the parents, it'll just be easier to write it. All right. So that's, comment. that's the first assumption. Notice what E is. That's a yes. It's in real income. No, so the idea, and that's an important point. Basically, the way this works is the parent has this stuff. It's called income. Some of it you eat, and some of it is is give. It, it becomes educational investment. E is the transformation of whatever the stuff is into, along with the shock, into the actual human capital. That's, a, uh, that this, okay, that's the skills model. That's actually a very different view. In other words, that what you have is not a, childhood is not T. Childhood is <laughs> 0 through 18 for the sake of argument. And there's a repeated interactions between the thing called a C in this model and the thing called an A. 
those interactions, some of them could have to do with money, others have to do with time, others have to do with something that's, which you know, was put on the table. It's a hard thing to talk about in, in terms of measurement, which is the quality of the parenting, and that produces an outcome. This model is not rich enough to talk about that stuff. Please. No, that would, that, that, that would kill the genetic interpretation. Now, that's another reason. Why, so you might say, well, what if, what if it weren't? How, how would I deal with it? I would say that the genetic component follows an AR process. And, rather than, and the only thing that would matter is that the parent, when they make a decision, uses her own ability to make the projections about the offspring ability. So that type of generalization would not qualitatively add to the model. Okay. So when I made these, uh, you know, pompous remarks about ass uh, assumptions, et cetera, you know, one of the art of doing, art, you know, issues in doing applied theory is to get rid of everything that won't add to the question, or won't add, to, won't add insight. All right. So uh, the second thing is that, uh, is the following, and that is, when I'm an adult, so now I was born at T, I'm not T minus one, I'm an adult, I, I'm gonna receive an income. Uh, notice that there's no choice about whether you work, you do it, okay? And my income's gonna be determined by two objects. The first is the human capital that was embedded in me in, during youth, which depended on my parents' investment and my, uh, uh, my, uh, my shock. And then uh, there's another shock that occurs to me as an adult. That's a different type of unobserved heterogeneity. In other words, one thing to say that I think there's heterogeneity and innate ability, a different type of unobserved heterogeneity would be differences in labor market luck. And obviously I could tell you lots of different stories about what labor market luck would mean. You've already heard one example. There's a sense in which it's a luck if uh, I'm embedded in a social network that communicates information for a good match. Another type of luck would be that the thing I'm good at, the market, signs a really high price to it. But uh, for our purposes, I'm just gonna think about the, the, sh the, the shocks having the property, they're not forecastable uh, at the time that uh, the parents make decisions. So the idea is, I've got a child, there's stuff I know about them, I make a decision as adults, so something else will happen, which I don't really have, have a clue about. And this model is so simple that when I talk about information sets, what a parent knows is actually full, the relevant information for the parent is simply the two variables, y and zeta. Okay, so now here's the one decision that these models embody. It's only one choice. As I said, you have to work. Uh, it's a tough world. And that is, as an adult, the parent divides the stuff y, this homogeneous good, into two pieces. One of it is a consumption piece and the other is the investment into the child. Okay, that's it. And the sense in which this is a little bit more than identity was brought up before, and that is in this model, there is an assumption that parents cannot pre-commit their children to pay parental debts. Okay, that is a, you know, one of the, an aspect of the, you know, the interesting deviations of an overlapping generations model from the you know, canonical Aero de Brew model. In other words, in these models, it matters about <laughs> the, the agents only exist over subsets of time, and so the natures of potential trades are, uh, are, are correspondingly altered. Now, as I mentioned before, if we were thinking about China, it's not clear that this assumption quite has the salience it does for the United States. In other words, you could imagine that extended families play a role in, uh, in defining what the financial constraint is, and similarly, different family structures may entail different types of obligations that people feel. So, as I said, I certainly wouldn't have paid any debts my parents had, but uh, in other society, might, somebody might feel an obligation. And, and we can't, those shouldn't be dismissed as, as squishy cultural matters. Those are first order matters. If you take seriously this constraint as the source of intergenerational immobility. That said, uh, uh, as Laurie pointed out when I said that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm stealing one of your comments. Uh, and that is in defense of this, that, uh, you know, these model that, I, he, he thought I was too harsh about the model when I said this before, on the grounds that 
this was a you know this was kind of a, a, an approximation of a richer notion of credit constraint, and I think that that's a fa that's a fair response. The only thing I want to say is that when we get to the skills model, the, th there is something different, which is the timing of the credit constraints is, becomes interesting. D did I steal? Well. Yeah, yeah, we have to be careful on what it would mean to pay paying the parents' debts because the idea would be that I invest in the child. That, that creates an expected payoff. That's the op and, and so an expected value, that's how the debt's going to be cleared in the next generation. So modulo, uh, a really, you know, something happening in the next period. In essence, what would happen is you would equalize the, the, uh, the rate of return on human capital across all the families. So that, that's kind of the first order thing that would you'd embody. You asked the second question, which is what if the sequence of draws actually sh shifts the, uh, the dynastic budget constraint? And so you could still get a notion of liquidity constraints, but I, th I, th I think given the, given the fact like shocks are assumed to be independent except for genes which attenuate rapidly, uh, it's, it's not clear that you, you could get a first order effect, but that's, the saying not clear doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. It means like I don't, I'm, I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. All right. So, so that's it. That's, a, as I said, that's the entire model. And so notice I haven't even told you what the preferences are of the parents. All I said is they make a decision. Now, the reason I said, I d I've intentionally not told you what the preferences are yet because there's a, in algebraic sense, I don't have to. And what do I mean by that? Whatever is the decision-making process of the parents, it must be the case that they make a decision based on two objects. One is their income, and the second is the child's ability. So there must be some mapping from child's ability and income to the investment. That's just, you know, that's a, that's a consequence of the, uh, the fact a decision is being made. What the decision is depends on the preferences. All right? Now, different models take different stances. Uh, Larry made a remark about Lowry's uh, paper being very seminal in terms of the use of dynamic uh, programming. That was a consequence of the way he conceptualized parental utility. And so his idea was that my utility depends on my consumption and uh, a discounted value of the utility of my offspring. Now, obviously, you don't know everything, so I have to put an expected value when I talk about the decisions, but that's the actual utility. All right? Well, and this is the standard trick. You obviously recursively solve that out, and the parent behaves as if she is solving a lifetime utility problem. All right, and that's why you need to have the infinite horizon dynamic programming machinery to talk about the parental decisions. In contrast, uh, you know, Becker and Thomas, for example, um, they focus on utility from my I get utility from my consumption and from the income of my child. Other papers say that I get utility from my uh, consumption and the human capital of my child. So all I want you to see as a mathematical point is that these don't matter. It's just saying there's a function g. Okay. Now, is there a correct one? Well, uh, I think that uh, I don't know how many people here have kids. Uh, at least three, uh, and. I don't know if uh, it's your first or second, but uh, first. Okay, you have my uh, word of honor, which I'm sure these gentlemen will uh, agree with, that, uh, that none of them fully capture the uh, uh, nature of the relationship. But the point is that th this isn't actually going to be key for the, surprisingly, this isn't really important for, the <laughs> for understanding what the model has to say about mobility. All right. And why, why do I, that's kind of a wild statement. I said, who cares what preferences are? What I'm really trying to say is the following. That's it. <laughs> in other words, the way to understand this model is that it has three functions in it. One function is the decision rule that maps child ability and adult income into a, the investment in the child. 
That was the G function. There was a second function, which was the translation of human cap of the investment in the child and ability into actual education. That's the F function. And then the E, I'm sorry, that was the uh, E function. And the F function was the translation of human capital and labor market love, luck, excuse me, uh, thinking about kids again, love, uh, into actual uh, income. Okay. Yes. The parents know the student's ability. Yeah. So, that's it. That's the whole model. Now, what do we make of that model? Notice number one, the economic logic, independent of the particular choice of preferences, gives the result that we can think of not as a statistical model, as a behavioral model, that there's some mapping of unobserved heterogeneity and parental income into offspring income. So in that sense, the IG model looks like it. it and by the way, it'd be clear, those IG regressions were, in the, were known at the time these models are being constructed. So you can see this at least, at least gives a, a, a behavioral interpretation to, the, to, to this, type, th th this type of environment. Well, maybe it does, except there's one little detail. Uh, I didn't write down the model that said offspring income equals some comp function of parental income and two unobserved uh, pieces of heterogeneity. Uh, the regression was offspring income equals alpha plus beta times <laughs> plus a shock. So what I wanted you to see was that in fact even the canonical model its bare bones structure says that the linear regression does not have a behavioral interpretation on its own. So the economic logic of the model doesn't generate the regression. Now, do we throw up our hands and say, therefore, it's not interpretable? Well, the answer is we don't have to. Uh, and the reason for that is, what I, then, is then to understand these class of models, and so if we're talking, for example, of Becker tomes and, uh, you know, particular forms that have been studied by, by Gary Solon. In essence, what, the, what is being done, uh, in particular in the extensions of the Becker-Tomes model, is to ask, okay, so, so before there were, three, there were three primitives that would have determined the, uh, that mapping I wrote down. I, need, I would need to know the preferences, because that would tell me what G is. And I need to know the technology that converts uh, investment into human capital. I need to know the other technology that converts human capital into, into income. And so what the literature then does is uh, a bit of reverse engineering. Suppose I wanted to know what, ask what functional forms will give me the intergenerational regression. Okay, and so that's, that, that, so, so the reason I'm, I'm kind of spending a lot of time in this is I want you to see the distinction between the key economic ideas, which place weak restrictions in terms of the relationship between the two. I mean, you've got a monotonicity relationship, or uh, a weak, that's about it. And, uh, and, and the actual empirical work that's done, which is based on particular choices of functional forms. Now, these choices of functional forms are not going to be insane or anything. I mean, they're kind of standard functional forms. But nevertheless, you want to understand where the economic le logic leaves off and the, uh, the, the functional forms uh, come into play. So the way that uh, one can actually generate an IGE as a, a behavioral model, as I said, through functional forms, and you won't be surprised at the tricks. So issue number one, is that one wants to have an environment in which there's some sort of semi-linearity, uh, since uh, uh, and and, the, and so the these models, the way that they're actually constructed, is that the uh, education of a child is the a function of the log of the parental investment plus the shock. First part is going to take and there's going to be a, a Cobb-Douglas preference assumption that's going to interact with that to ensure linearity. That's why the first term's there. The additive separability, obviously, because I want the error in the regression to correspond to a behavior, the unobserved heterogeneity. So I'm going to need all the all that stuff to somehow end up at the end of the uh, of the model. Okay, so that's assumption one. Second assumption is again a, uh, sem a semi-linear model in the sense that at the level of income will be determined by constant, we don't, uh, which is not of interest, there'll be a wage, which is this, uh, with respect to log education plus another shock, please. Uh, 
Okay, well, great. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I'm just thinking that when when it's additive, you would have a substitution and so it's the kit that they you, 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 You're exactly right. In fact, I'm, I'm delighted you brought that up. An important assumption in the Becker Tomes paper, and they're clear about this. I'd almost say that this is some remember, they wrote that paper with point two in their minds. So the question is both, they wanted to have an understanding of family investment leading to offspring income, but second, they also had a kind of a vision as to quantitatively what's going on. So, you know, I don't want to say I've, I've read their mo Becker's mind, I know exactly, but th that's the background. This model does not have the following, and this is, well, first of all, you know, you're supposed to say, well, well if there's more than one kid. Well, th the way that Becker told it allows for more than one kid, but the key is the following, and that is the ability shocks do not affect the marginal product of investment. And so the way the model, their model is set up, the ability shock for the child is actually, it's a, there's only an income effect. It's as if that, be, when you go through the algebra, it becomes part of the, there's an implicit parental budget constraint where they get to decide what fraction of that shock their kid keeps versus <coughs> transferring it to the other child. How do they do that? By altering the education decisions. If I wanted to uh, get a different result, which is increased persistence, I would allow for a relative price effect. And so as a parent, you know, since I love my children equally and I have a concave family uh, welfare function, I'm going to be smoothing stuff for them. That's the usual argument. On the other hand, if I say there's a price difference, in other words, even though I'd like to smooth on the other, it's really cheap to get the something higher for the other kid, that's when you would get uh, additional invest, possibly additional investment in the more able child. Another way of telling the story I'm, I'm sure you meant economics, but okay. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, so, and, 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 and then the child who's not interested in proceeding to a higher degree of education, naturally the parent wouldn't invest. That, that, that's it's just another side of the coin, I guess. I think you add, you're at, the, the second point to me is a little different, and that is your point, which is that, that you could say this is where you think the preference assumptions matter. In other words, if I care about the utility of my offspring, and I know they don't like education, well, then that's a reason I would not invest in them. On the other hand, if you weren't you, you're me, and the only thing I cared about was their education, I would <laughs> be damned if they didn't go to college, <laughs> whether they wanted to or not. So that, the second point, it's true, I'm not gonna lie, they know it. <laughs> okay, the, the serious point is, you're, the, I wanna distinguish two points. Point number one is there's no relative, uh, pr there's no difference in the marginal productivity of parental investment in this model. If I embedded the preference shocks differently, then I would get that, and that's why you could get the, the invest more in the high quality, uh, higher ability child. A second issue is if I look at the utility of the child, I might want to think about what the educational investment means differently. Okay, so those are just two, diff two different mechanisms, please. And, 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 please, and please don't criticize my uh, parental preferences. Okay. <laughs> Yes. I would think that if we thought about, about the G function, G function and the E function, mm -hmm. the G function as a production function, it would be uh, more natural to think of the investment as ability as complements rather than substance. Yes. Yeah, and, and that, that's why I remember about the relative price. That's, that's exactly the point. The marginal product of investment here is decoupled from the child's ability. By the way, that, ca that came up in the, in, the, in the Heckman lectures. Why do I say that? Remember he made an argument that even if it makes sense in an efficiency sense to invest in children who are more able later, you wouldn't want to do it earlier? That's because of the complementarity that was dynamic. A way to think about it is that by investing in quote, you know, children in a certain way early, you change the distribution of marginal products of investment in the second period. So even though conditional on them, you might want to invest in the more able every period in isolation, the thing you need to account for is the effects of your investments on the evolution, essentially, of the marginal productivities. Here, what's missing is that the marginal productivities aren't even dependent on shocks. They're, they're 
the investment product market productivity are fixed. And that, that's a serious matter. Yes. Oh, it does in this model. It, it does depend on it, but it does. But the point was that the way that the model is constructed with these functional forms, it is not the case that the marginal product of investment depends on that shock. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that, that's right. Now, I'm not comfortable saying anything about U.S. data in the sense that um, I don't know enough about investment decisions in less affluent families if the, if the investment in college is lumpy, so you have to pick one child. That's kind of a historical story told about immigrants, that the, you, 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 know, you would lavish the uh, investment on one person to raise the family up. So in the American case, I'm not comfortable saying that that's a, an issue in the 21st century. But that doesn't mean other contexts and other societies, that's maybe a first order issue. Part of what has to be in your story, I think, to make it sing, is you need a, uh, uh, a lack of continuity in the investments. In other words, I think, so uh, what was the one flow of the cuckoo's nest? Two half cigarettes don't make a cigarette. So you don't send two of your kids to college for two years, you send one for four years and one zero. So that, that's when I think that the, uh, these issues would be more salient. And I just don't have an empirical sense for the US whether this is, in 2013, an issue. Which is not to say it isn't. I'm just saying I don't know. You're asking a very. Well, you're asking a slightly different question, which is conditional on the distribution of family sizes and income, and focusing on African Americans. Are the poor families facing credit constraints for college now? And that's quite contested, because there, are, of course, is much financial aid available to disadvantaged families, and so. Heckman and LaFontaine did a study and concluded something on the order of 4% of children would, uh, are, are in fact, in the United States would be constrained uh, when one accounts for the available need-based aid. Other studies have found, have, you know, so there's still some debate about this, but um, again, I'm just not sure for the American experience I could make, a, make, make an argument that this is empirically first order, which is based on it in my, uh, my understanding of where the literature is. The, the credit constraint issue, uh, I think, is the focus, at least within economics, has been on, on constraints uh, in earlier in life. So in other words, it's one thing to say that there's, uh, uh, as of last year, because who knows what is going to happen now, uh, that there's enough need-based financial aid for kids from poor families that can go to college if they want, even though they have to assume non-trivial debt. Um, versus saying, um, saying that, the, the, that the parents have to actually make the 
make these trade-offs. Okay, again, I'm, I'm talking just one case, and I'm just I'm just not sure that the data would support that. Yeah, and so, uh, and the the sentence which I omitted was to say uh, where, where a lot of the interesting action is is on investment issues. Was I constrained at when my child was three, not when they're eighteen? Yeah. Okay, and that and that mo this model doesn't really have the. Uh, the, the, the temporal depth to do that. Okay, so uh, that's it. In other words, you can make two functional form assumptions, and you can mess her. And then, uh, the, I'm sorry, the final one is that uh, shock of shocks use Cobb Douglas. Now, why is that enormously valuable? Cobb Douglas promises us, gives us constant budget shares. Let's see now. All the uh, relative prices are fixed, and I have constant budget shares. Guess what? <laughs> my investments are proportional to my income, and we're done. So in other words, this one's absolutely critical because I want to have a linear relationship, and that's where it comes from. All right, so you just add all that together, and lo and behold, there's the model. In other words, you get an equilibrium law of motion that said there's a complicated constant term. Uh, you have dependence on income, on uh, on uh, the parent's income, and then you have the two shocks. And so one of the shocks is typically assumed to be an AR1, and so you account for that in the stochastic process. When you estimate, you say it's an, AR, it's a, it's an arm of 1, 1, as opposed to a, a literal AR1, but that's, that's the whole model. All right, so what I wanted you to see is, as I said, the economic logic gets us this far. The functional forms, which as I said, you know, they're crazy things, they're all variants of Cobb Douglas ideas, give us literally the, the IGE regression. And the one detail is one has to account for the fact that the errors are uh, autocorrelated, or are, are themselves autocorrelated. Why is that something you have to account for? Because that means the regressor actually isn't uncorrelated with the error. All right, that's, that is the model. Okay, and so to follow that up, the way that you kind of work this thing out with more details, you put in a certain uh, lambda here is the uh, dependence coefficient uh, in the, uh, in the unobserved heterogeneity with respect to ability, then I can ask what happens in the projection of parents' income and offspring income, and you end up with this, uh, you know, th this object here. Okay, that's the whole model. All right, so as I said, the, uh, uh, just the, the credit constraints uh, f functionally are having to do with, with this, this issue of commitment. And so I want to distinguish that from with it, from inequality, the ability to get borrow against my income next period. That's, that was the only point. All right, is everybody clear on what this whole class of models is saying? It's saying income is the thing that matters. The families in isolation are simply dividing their incomes each generation between educational investment and consumption. And what's going to drive things is the dependence of my, the investment decisions of the parents on their own income. Okay, that's it. And if I want to get a linear model of that, then I need to, uh, I'm implicitly, if I want to interpret the linear model uh, as, the, as an equilibrium law of motion, then I have some functional forms. Please. Pardon me? Yes. So, well, what has to, so, so one, in this particular model, the answer is, uh, it doesn't matter for kind of a silly reason, well, for a reason that, the following, and that is, this doesn't have any issues of time consistency. I don't care about the utility of the descendants, I cared about their budget constraint of my child. So what you would like is to take the Lowry model, replace the assumption of a constant utility discount rate, and then ask the question, what is the implication under this alternative structure? So you could, and, and, any, and the arguments you could make could be derivative from that. That's the way that I would think about it. Yes? Yes. Yes. <laughs> 
Well, you raise a different. It's related to the when I said that the issue here is you can't commit the kids. The analogous thing in the Samuels. So the Samuels an overlapping generation. Chocolate was a very unkind thing, since there's some schools that take this as a literal model of money, and some colleagues of people in this room that do. Uh, <laughs> the idea is that there's a piece of paper. It has something on it, and since everybody thinks it's valued. The way that I am able to consume when I'm old is I give a young person the piece of paper, and because everybody's at all periods think it has a value, that, that smooths the consumption. All right? So I don't think there's a, as I say, it's in the same spirit of saying that it isn't really that there's a market missing here, it's merely that the demographic structure of the economy doesn't permit, metaphorically, people don't exist at the same point in time, so they can't make contracts. And so the government intervention. Uh, which is M, is, is to create this, this store of value that allows for the shifting to occur. Now, one reason I don't want to push too hard on the difference, uh, okay, so, so that, that would be point number one. And you're right that these models really are about social security. In other words, a transferring of income across dynasties. Here, I think the issue is, is a little bit different. However, the fact that a government intervention could be efficient is the same. In other words, I could tax Larry to uh, invest in my kids and then uh, uh, remit a uh, tax break to his uh, in the next generation. So in other words, you can imagine public finance overcoming uh, the, the fact that this market can't exist or that uh, individuals can't be, who can't come into the world with, uh, with debt commitments. And so that's the spirit in which I would, I would, I would push that. All right, so fortunately, okay, how are we doing on time? Terribly, okay. Uh, second comment, I will, and this I will be very brief, is that in my view, of when we're lining up theories of intergenerational mobility, the lectures on Monday are a separate body of theory. And what I mean by that is these are models, what I'm calling the skill life course dynamics, which are unpacking the overlapping generations model. In other words, there isn't a thing called childhood, which is just a, one period, rather, it's an unpacking to say that there's this complicated, there's a dynamic process that is the life course, and events are transpiring at each point in the life course, and those are determining, for the sake of argument, the age of 18, the vector of skills somebody brings as an adult to the labor market or to post-secondary education. <coughs> okay. What becomes, and so, and, and, and Jim went over some of these objects uh, a little bit, and, um, and, and so what the literature does is it focuses on, uh, on, on two, two areas. One of them is that some notion of cognitive ability, and that comes in two flavors. One is so-called fluid intelligence, the other is crystal. Uh, the distinction is that uh, fluid is closer to creativity, solving theorems, or f discovering new theorems as opposed to uh, uh, being able to do the problem set correctly where somebody else has already established that or draw upon knowledge. That distinction is important. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm every year, I'm, I'm happier with the fact that uh, crystal intelligence grows even when fluid intelligence decreases with age. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> and, then the, and then the other idea, uh, psychologists hate the term non-cognitive skills. They prefer it to be called personality skills. Basically says that when you enter the market, you're, you're shocked. Everybody's complicated. And um, in the study of, of, of answers to questions trying to elicit a notion of personality, as an empirical matter, uh, the covariation in the answers using factor analysis is suggestive of sort of five objects that could explain individual within individual heterogeneity of the questions and then idiosyncratic stuff. And that's where the acronym uh, OCEAN comes from because when people then looked at the factors, remember this is a, first you sort of say the data seem to have an implicit covariance structure and second, it, once you sort of see what these factors are, weighted averages or questions or what have you, you can then identify whether they're interpretable. And so it turned out that the good news was they're interpretable. And that is, that, so one of them has to do with, you know, so the acronym's OCEAN, and those are the five uh, subsets. For our purpose, uh, and these are the equations he gave before, is that one thinks about the evolution of this vector of cognitive skills, the vector of non-cognitive skills, as having dynamics in which every period there's parental investments or so, so, uh, society's investments, those are the eyes, and there's dynamic relationships between what the skills are today and what they were last period. HI is just initial conditions. 
So as an algebraic matter, it has to be the case that these systems uh, end up looking like the combination of initial conditions and the sequence of quote unquote investments. Now notice the investments, that's a catch all for everything that happens to the child at each point in time. And so one could think, you know, there's nothing special, the, the, the focus on investments because of the interest in, in understanding the, uh, the volitional aspect of parenting and how that can matter. But obviously I could build into the same logic, you know, events in the life course. In other words, if you're sick for six months and, and you know, poor health in childhood would be an example of something that uh, uh, one, one would not call that an investment, but would still be something that had persistent consequences. All right, now what matters in these models is this notion of dynamic complementarity. It's just a fancy way of saying that uh, if you look at stocks at one point in time, they affect what the marginal valuations are of the associated investments. And then the second idea is there may be cases where uh, you have uh, uh, critical development periods. In other words, there may be times when the marginal product's extremely high if the stock of skills at that point in time is very high. That type of argument uh, has strong neuroscience uh, foundations. In other words, a lot is known about the development of different parts of the brain. And uh, I'll claim everybody in the room is familiar with one example in which there's a period of critical development. Something happens around the age of 14. It's a uh, laugh. I'm talking about language acquisition. It's much harder for adults to learn foreign languages than children. And so there, and there's very clean neuroscience on that, which is sort of at some point your brain freezes in metaphorically uh, certain uh, cognitive structures. And that's why you know, children can learn multiple languages with great ease, whereas uh, uh, I, uh, others like me can't do it, <laughs> no matter how hard we try. All right. So that, that's that again, that's a cheap example because it's so well understood. Deeper ones, and this is what comes out of the Perry preschool, is it appears that that the ages of three to five are a critical period with respect to the formation of non-cognitive skills. There's also uh, uh, you know, issues of, uh, of, of the, the formation of synapses that, and, when, and you know, when that occurs in, in development. And so the, the, the point is that the neuroscience says that the investments, the timing is very important. Okay, so, just we, so the, again, I don't want to push this too hard. And... Uh, because Jim's already done this in great detail. What I, these are just the three points I want to make. Number one, that this enriches the, the things we care about in talking about mobility. In other words, you get away from income as the be-all and the end-all. We rather think that a person has these, these, these skills, these characteristics, and we look at the evolution of the vector. Okay, so then that's, a, that's a richer conception, and as I mentioned on Monday, that's much closer to the Aristotelian notion of, of virtues, because the notion there isn't just moral. Is that you're capable of reflective decision making, self control, et cetera. And that actually links up with a, an area in philosophy. The second point is that it breaks the OLG uh, primitive uh, timing. In other words, it actually has a notion of a life cycle. And that sort of thing becomes important because you get results such as the constraints that matter aren't in the United States aren't the constraints with respect to college attendance necessarily, they're respect to things like preschool attendance. And that's a very different way to think about it. And it's not shocking that you know people in their 20s, when you have kids, that's it's when they're young that you probably uh, would like to borrow against your future income if you if 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 you if you could. All right. So let me just stop the, uh, on that one simply because uh, the Heckman lectures and the lecture notes delineate a very rich vision of intergenerational mobility that's generated via cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So what I want to turn to now is the idea that, uh, one, I say this is a good thing to think about, social influences. In other words, uh, to, 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 to ask whether we can conceptualize the evolution of, of economic status across generations in a context in which obviously parents matter, but what the parents are doing, quote unquote, is they're influencing the social structure, the social environment in which children are developing. All right, and so the issue is not to say it's not parents, it's that it's uh, society or something like that. It's rather simply to say that one, one looks for a different uh, uh, proximate cause, as it were, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of socioeconomic outcomes, and then uh, and that becomes the focus. So uh, 
I'm going to talk about models in which there's simply neighborhood effects. Uh, but th and then I'll talk about why these are kind of more general ideas. Okay. So the way that I want you to think about the thought experiment is the becker tomes model. That view was, I'm a parent. I took some of my income and I invested in my child. So you think of me as a nice Victorian gentleman. And I hired a private tutor from Cambridge to come and uh, uh, teach my kid. All right. Well, in 2013, it worked a little differently. I, uh, uh, my wife and I carefully identified what neighborhood we thought it would be best to move to because we liked that high school and thought that would be the best for our kids. And so the investment that I made in, in uh, high school education, I, think, I may have given this, I'm sure we gave the school some money for charitable purposes, but the investment was the purchase of the residence. Okay, that's just really a different vision of how, uh, how inequality transpires. Now, does, this have, does that distinction matter? Well, let's, let's play that out. In the Becker Tomes world, how do we think, you know, in, in the family income investment model, what's, what's going to be the big deal? Well, you brought it up. Are there scholarships available uh, for college, for example? In other words, we would be concerned, or if we wanted to use an OLG vision, about the nature of the credit limitations. All right, well, if you take the neighborhoods model, um, I know this may come as a shock, but uh, school district boundaries were not determined by. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> by, a by physics. In other words, these are political choices. They can be changed. Uh, similarly, schools can have different, and this is what Scott will talk about this afternoon, different rules for the assignment of students to the schools. In other words, one world is that the residence is a local proximity uh, rule. Another one could be uh, that there has to be a certain number of slots kept open at every school for, for everybody. Yet another policy idea would be magnet schools. In other words, you set up schools that are unusually high quality, but you set certain rules for the uh, socioeconomic and ethnic composition. So in other words, when you shift to the neighborhood or the social perspective, na other policies sort of naturally sit on the table. All right, so I'm just going to describe a model. Uh, as I said, I, it's not the best, but it's uh, the easiest to, uh, to do a parallel to the, uh, to the other one. And so the thought experiment here is going to be the following, and that is, I've got dark families. I'm going to keep the same demography, two, gener two generation overlapping generations model. And I'm going to rule out everything about parents except for the choice of neighborhood. So this is going to be totally as social as I can get. So I've got a population. There's going to be some probability, uh, there's going to be some probability uh, measure that describes the incomes. And I'm going to assume that, OK, this is the sort of technical thing. Just Okay, there's a continuum of agents. The only reason to make that assumption is I don't want anybody to actually be able to influence the per capita income in the neighborhood and all that good stuff. So this is just uh, uninteresting technique in the paper. It, just, it basically says, you don't, the fact that you, if Bill Gates moves to my neighborhood, he doesn't give $50 billion and change what the uh, school resources are. All right, so, uh, and I don't think he's moving there. I'm going to use preferences that uh, we just saw. In other words, my, I care about my consumption. I care about the income of my child. As I said, I don't, I'm not thinking about whether they're happy. I'm thinking about whether they have a big budget set. Now, by the way, it doesn't sound as crazy as you think about it. After all, isn't that what the capabilities approach says? Not with respect to income. And that's why it looks silly here. But I could have a richer conception saying, I don't know my, my children. They have to decide what their lives are going to be like. What I want is that they have the biggest set of options possible. So however. The, you know, so they don't, they're frustrated, so to speak. Okay, and so on. then in the same model, again, this is looking very similar to the other model. The only difference is uh, modulo a triviality on the fact I actually uh, m made the model uh, purely linear, is that the income of an adult is, is determined by the human capital, but the human capital is not a family-specific object, it's a social object. It's determined by the neighborhood. Okay, so there's no private education here. There's no private anything. You live in a neighborhood, there'll be some unobserved heterogeneity that might be individual specific. That, but otherwise, w the neighborhood you grew up in, the community from which you're from, that, uh, that's the controlling variable. And again, I'm choosing the functional forms. I want you to see the exact parallel to the, to the, uh, to the other model. All right. What was the analogy of saying, I'm an adult, my income gets split between consumption and investment in my child? Well, th there is no investment in children. However, you do something else. It's called pay taxes. <laughs> and so, and thinking about the budget constraint now, it's, it's determined by the political economy. And that is whatever decisions are made by the community or the neighborhood to allocate resources. Okay. For simplicity, assuming nice linear taxes, obviously life can get more complicated if you think about 
richer tax schemes. Since the objective of this type of exercise was to get the mobility result, I think that it's okay to be uh, crude on the uh, political economy. However, in other contexts, it's extremely important to, to focus on political economy. For an example, suppose I had a private school option in this model. Well, now we have a problem, which is they, if I don't like the taxes, I might just miss, let's say I don't like what others do, I might just withdraw from the public school system, and my preferences would move from one tax rate to zero. So the existence, in fact, of voting equilibria can be problematic in richer environments, and the model is intentionally rigged to get those problems off the table. All right. And the final thing is to say that uh, the way the model's going to work is the number of neighborhoods and the populations of the neighborhoods, those are actually going to be endogenous. So this model, can, you know, you have this fishery and over time or agglomeration. So one has to build, you, so one question would be, why would anybody ever not, why, why wouldn't the richest family live in isolation? So I end up with a continuum of neighborhoods, blah, blah, blah. Well, the trick is obviously, I, I, step one is I, I uh, the trick at some level has to be that the, nobody can function in isolation. That gives pro positive uh, population measures to each of the neighborhoods. And the second thing is to have some, something a little bit better than that, which is to say that when we think, and this is the cheapest way to do it, that the neighborhood's investment in education exhibits some type of non-convexity. So if I had other people with the same income as me, I'd like to live with them because we could collectively do more. Okay, and, that, and this is just a functional form that generates that. And I don't, you know, I, I think that, uh, that um, you know, one could tell many stories about that. But again, the point is that we want them to be non-trivial neighborhoods. And we want to have people to have some incentive to uh, 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 care about something about their neighbors. And, we'll, and that obvi that's already been built in. The final thing is that I'm going to build in uh, some sort of notion of a, of a social interaction. And the way that that's going to work is that the productivity of the neighborhood's educational investment for the child is mediated by the characteristics of the community. So if you invest a certain amount in education in a community where nobody's gone to college, you get a different payoff than otherwise. The shortcut in this model, since it isn't rich enough to describe that, is that the income distribution itself is the carrier of the, uh, of the community effect. Again, micro foundations, that, that you wouldn't get that, but the, the beast I want at the end is a mapping of the income distribution at t to t plus one, and so wherever possible, we want to make sure that the income distribution is the carrier of, uh, of, the, of the phenomena we care about. All right, so believe it or not, that's the, uh, that's the, whole, uh, that's the whole model. With one, one detail, I haven't told you how neighborhoods form, and in the baseline model, I'm going to do something, I'm just going to assume a core notion, which basically says any group of families that wants to live together, they can form a neighborhood and keep whoever they want out, so it's like a club. You can show that that same equilibrium is sustainable with prices. So in other words, I could set a set of rental prices across the neighborhood, such as the core allocation, is simultaneously supported as, a, as an equilibrium uh, via, via price differentials. Okay. This is where the Benabu paper is critical to read because that gives a particularly general and a very clean description of cases in which prices can support, in particular, stratification of neighborhoods. So the question is, I've got a rich neighborhood and a poor neighborhood. Why don't the poor move to the rich neighborhood? Well, my, you know, the baseline in the paper says that because you get to shut the gate on them. It's a real gated community. Obviously, a better model would say that there's price differentials that, uh, that support the stratification. Uh, so there's something I don't actually know the answer to. We, the private school. Oh, oh, you're, oh, so the way I want to say it is the private school, the, 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 what I call the, the prices for the neighborhoods, those could also be the tuitions for the schools. So that, that would be the equivalent. The reason I hesitated is the private schools, I have to, one has to be a little careful on thinking about, I don't know what the rules are legally for, some schools, and in terms of being, I don't think it could be a nonprofit. Uh, t I, I think that there would be tax consequences if you said nobody who's not rich can go to school or something like that. So the mechanism for the sorting has to be the equivalent of a price for the membership, which of course uh, it would just be tuition. All right, so that's the whole uh, that's the whole model. I know it's a mess, but it's as simple as you can get it. <laughs> the points are following. <laughs> 
the, the model basically has qu the following qualitative features. Okay, the first one is you can show that the equilibrium allocation of families across neighborhoods in every period is strictly stratified. In other words, if you took the income density, you could divide it up like a sausage, and the, this, the highest income families from the top to some level will live in the first neighborhood, then there'll be another swath in the second neighborhood, so on and so forth. All right, so you know in some sense I wanted that result because I wanted to get persistence in inequality and uh, persistence in socioeconomic status. And so segregation with respect to income or you know, often normally, or, at least, uh, or stratification, that's going to generate it. Okay? Yeah. Oh, like she did. Uh, that was where Cobb Douglas w uh, wins the day. I chose Cobb Douglas. Remember, I said that in the, in, the, in the family models, the reason we choose Cobb Douglas is we want constant budget shares, and therefore my investment in my child is proportional to my income. Well, if they can do it, I wanted to do it. But in here, what happens is my preferred tax rate is, is the weight. And since everybody has the pre same preferences, everybody wants that to be the, uh, in other words, we have to worry about the median voter uh, in the sense that everybody agrees on the ideal tax rate. Now, obviously, that, that's, the, that's the place where I, and this one I was scared about. Uh, you would know how to do it, I don't. Which is to allow for richer, uh, richer preferences in which there's disagreements on, uh, on what the ideal tax rate is. But you can see what the complication is. Now, so when we think about neighborhoods, uh, in this model, everybody who is, is in one of these neighborhoods I refer to as the equilibrium, that's a neighborhood, and they not only they want to be their conditional in the neighborhood, everybody would like, that's the ideal kind of configuration for everybody. Once I, once I introduce either you know, restrictions on size or deeper types of notions of preference heterogeneity, which were ruled out because of the assumption here, because the only heterogeneity I care about the taxes, then there's a question of, of what happens if you want to be my neighbor, but I don't want, actually, I want to be your neighbor, but you would like to have a higher class neighbor. Uh, that's why we have to talk about whether prices can support the equilibrium. And so the key thing in the Benabu work is to clarify that the marginal willingness to pay can be calculated in a very specific way, and that tells you whether or not there are prices that support stratification. Okay, now what, but what is not fully worked out is an environment in which we sort of use Benabu type results and we have a richer political economy. And so, and what I mean by that is that we can have contested uh, preferences over the taxes. All right, and so as I said, okay, c question number one, why do we get stratification? The answer is that everybody wants richer neighbors. And that's because the model was rigged to say that. I want richer neighbors for two reasons. One, they improve the efficient, the payoff to investment. Uh, you know, that is a short, the model could be a shorthand for the quality of social connections, role models, what have you. And the second thing is, since we're, I know what the tax rate is, I really would love you to pay a lot. And so, <laughs> and so this corresponds to the, uh, Larry, isn't there an old saying that everybody wants to be the poorest person in their neighborhood? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's the whole point. That's, that's the ideal for me. All right, and then the fact that I don't have to worry about the political economy issues is all uh, derivative from Cog Douglas. Okay, so now we can sort of ask what happens in this model, because now I have a set of families, their incomes are evolving, right? So I could, I gave you some calculations I like to do, I would like to do, such as what's the conditional probability that there's a crisscross, i.e. there's a reversal in the relative income statuses after one generation, two generations, so on and so forth. Those are the sorts of things that this model allows one to calculate. So here's the sort of thing you could do is, and remember that the way the model was structured, if I wanted to predict how you're gonna do as an adult, what I need to know is the, the community you're from. Conditional on that, your parents played no role. And so that's why it was, it was and it was done because I wanted to have, I didn't want any of the family investment model in there. So what I can think about is if I look at the kids within a neighborhood, there's going to be an expected growth for each of them in income, and that's G of N. The realized growth is G of N plus various sources of unobserved heterogeneity. So unsurprisingly, what you can prove as, as long as there's, a, if I looked at two neighborhoods, if one is bigger than the second and it has higher income, per capita income, 
that's sufficient to ensure the growth rates are different across the neighborhoods. Okay, oh, what that is saying, okay, why does that follow from the algebra? The answer is the following, and that is I have these two neighborhoods. This one, income distribution is strictly higher than this one. The only way you could get a, a reversal in the relative, in, the ex, in an expected value sense, is if this neighborhood were so small that it can't cash in, no pun intended, on the non-convexities associated with production. And so lo and behold, you can go, okay, so that's, uh, that's the intuition. So work, okay, so now we have the model, and this is what you can prove. With positive probability, this model will exhibit permanent inequality in the sense that if I look at the ratio of incomes of a rich and poor family in the model, with positive probability, their dynasty will never, it'll never decrease as I look across the generations. Okay, so you're getting a very strong inequality. Well, I want to say two things. You're, you're getting per permanent inequality in, in the stochastic sense I referred to before. I didn't say rich and poor family, it is certain that their descendants will never alter the rank order. What I said is there was something in the guts of the model that said that there's, that's not guaranteed. It's it maybe possible, according to the sample path realization of shocks, that not only is there never a uh, reversal, the initial gap never attenuates. Okay, so why am I getting such a strong result? Uh, the way to think about it is that um, this model had all this stuff built into it by assumption that said, Children in more affluent neighborhoods are, have great, better economic prospects than children in less affluent neighborhoods. That's really all it said. And the way that it's formalized in this model is to say they expect a growth rate in the income from the parents is going to be higher if you grow up in a rich neighborhood than otherwise. Okay, and it came out of both the bigger tax base and from the assumption that the income distribution in a neighborhood was was the catch-all for all the, of the, all the social interactions where, you know, Larry delineated kind of what real mechanisms would be like. Okay, once you have those two things, that gives you a stochastic process that has this property. Okay. All of the assumptions about the functional forms, what they did is they made the proofs easy. <laughs> In other words, okay, so I'll, you know, this was a reverse engineering exercise is when I, you know, in the sense that as it happens, I know what the author was thinking, which is he had a particular view of what might generate persistent inequality or permanent inequality, which was these neighborhoods, people are kind of self, you know, there's stratification by income that's generating differential opportunity sets in a growing economy. And then I sort of look at how the um, stratification evolves across time. Well, if two people are far enough apart, there's a positive probability they're never going to be in the same neighborhood. And once I have that, then there's a positive probability that growth rates are never going to uh, uh, be equal, let alone uh, reverse themselves, and that's how I got the positive probability for the limit. Uh, there's a trivial mathematical uh, way to think about it in terms of mathematics, which is um, that's how I want to think about it. So suppose I had a, a random walk, and I started there. And suppose the random walk has drift away from an absorbing barrier. All right, everybody with me? You take a random walk and you add to it a linear time trend. What do we know about that process? With positive probability, it will never hit the absorbing barrier. So what do you do with the model? You somehow show that the Stochastic pro well, somehow. You show the stochastic process generated by the model can be, has to be isomorphic in its probabilities to a random walk with a drift away from an absorbing barrier, and then you're done, because we already knew that with positive probability you'll never hit the absorbing barrier. But the intuition here is that what's generating the drift away from the absorbing barrier, that's not a constant thing, it's a period by period object, and that's why you have to be a little bit careful when you actually do the proof. Uh, now, relative to thinking about poverty traps, notice that, um, uh, let me stop there. Number one, that the poverty trap only exists in a stochastic sense. There's never any guarantee at any point in time that a family will not get out of poverty. There's never any guarantee at any point in time that two families will not have a reversal in the rankings of the descendants. But the probability is going down the bigger the gap is, and the probability is simply not one that it'll ever reverse itself. 
Now this result is living off something very important. And that is, remember when I started the first thing I said, oh, by the way, you notice that beta, if it's bigger than one, watch out, complicated things can happen. This is a model that's actually looking at families in a growing economy. And it's looking at kind of at the, at the ratio of their incomes. Okay, and so in that sense, as an economy grows, you might say it's not the kind of, that's a, na a natural thing I would assert to look at in terms of inequality. Uh, so that, that, and then it separately it distinguishes that from a case where the economy is growing, but some people simply don't grow. And so those are the two distinct mechanisms that are going in. And so what's happening with positive probability is some people literally are trapped. In other words, they just kind of get at a certain level of fluence they can never obtain. And second, you get the same phenomena for the, uh, uh, for the relative income shares. And the bottom line is this is a way of translating the notion of a poverty trap into a growing environment. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to say about that. Okay, so let me just make a couple of uh, comments. Uh, okay, so that's a model that directly parallels uh, the family investment models, are, and it's all driven by neighborhoods. And it, you know, admittedly, in an artificial way, it built in this idea that the distribution of socioeconomic outcomes across the parents on two dimensions is affecting the offspring. One was what I called the social interactions, black box, and second was the political economy. Please. I wonder if you can speculate a bit about how you can say what I, I'm sure you, you meant that in a, in a happy way. <laughs> but if we start thinking about how networks and social interactions then that takes us away from some kind of approach where um, you know, it doesn't matter in the world. I'm not sure the model, so up, I don't think the model's rich enough to incorporate that in a beyond the, the black box of that capital theta fund. I'm being honest, I'm not sure about that. Again, throw the algebra in the trash. There's, just, there's only one, two, one idea, okay, <laughs> or two ideas. One, you benefit when you have uh, more affluent neighbors in terms, your children do, either, via this black box that was supposed to capture the Larry's micro, and then second, the political economy. And second, that fact, generates an equilibrium segregation by income. And so that puts families on different trajectories, and that's what, and that, I mean, you know, once you have those two things, then, then you get the results. And, but I, I just, it seems to me that, well, you should speak to it, because you, you have to do it, I can't. Okay, yeah. Thank you. 
I, I think that that's a very important point because, the, you know, I had a, th there's income segregation here, but if we're talking about inequality in America, we have to say this, if we're talking about inequality between ethnic groups, and that's a different, by the way, source for segregation as well as has different consequences. Good. All right, so I want to make a few comments about sort of matching and, uh, pardon me, I'm sorry, please. So I guess the, the point I would make there is then one wants to ask about the, th that also is an argument that the intergenerational focus is not uh, entirely satisfactory. In other words, you could say regardless of what the kids do, that some groups are discriminated against, and so that, that's, just, that's just a fact. And so if you want to understand black-white inequality, it's the fact of discrimination, not the, you wouldn't focus on the trans, because <laughs> of the triviality that an ethnic identity is transmitted from the parents to the kids. And that, that, that simply wouldn't be the mechanism for persistent inequality. And I think an important extension of these types of models, there's a little bit of where Patrick Bayer, for example, has models of, you know, talked about preferences over neighborhoods, but I think to talk seriously about racial inequality does need to superimpose on a structure like this, obviously important other considerations, and they're gonna be adult considerations as well as this focus on, uh, on early child, on childhood. So, uh, I, what I want to say is the neighborhoods model has embedded in it a form of a sort of match in equilibrium. In other words, rich match with rich, and poor are obliged to match with poor. That type of argument also appears in models that attempt to use a sort of matching or mating itself as t helping to explain persistence. So if dukes and duchesses marry, they have uh, very noble children, and so on and so forth. And there's particular interest uh, and this is really, this is, sociology has done much more on this than e economics has, is on, on increasing a sort of matching by education. And so it's obvious that I don't have to take some, you know, genetic approach, basically the character, having highly educated parents is conducive to socioeconomic success, so if you have higher a sort of matching education, unsurprisingly, that can become a mechanism for generating inequal, uh, uh, intergenerational mobility. Really, all I want, and you know, I could tell other stories. I could say there's something about the economy where we may see increasing matching of, of quality of workers across firms. Now, that implicitly could give me, because that's, that actually affects permanent income, that could then create a mechanism for uh, intergenerational persistence. And so even despite my comment about the Gatsby curve, this is one where you would say that the labor market outcome, that's a kind of a steady state thing, and so that, that alters my uh, time scale concern. So I just, well, really all I wanted to say is that's, uh, you know, the way that these things uh, show up is, and this has been repeated several times, is via this idea of complementarity. And so the, you know, what you see often in, 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 the, in various literatures is, some, is, uh, is, is attention to is the concept of complementarity, which I presume everybody knows. And, it, and if, it, if we're in a nice smooth world, these are just statements about cross partials, now they're, and that they're positive. And, um, and the, um, where the modern literature is, which I assume is, I hope is taught in, in most places, is to focus on not complementarity with respect to cross partials, but really in terms of values of functions on, uh, on, uh, on ordered sets, uh, semi, uh, uh, partially ordered sets called lattices, which have a, a couple of uh, closure properties associated with them. And there, basically the idea is, if I look at the difference between a high and low value of something, it's increasing, and whether other things are high or low. That, and, if, and with, con with you know, second order definition, but that's all complementarity is saying. It's saying the first derivative of something is increasing in, in the level of something else. So this, is, uh, this leads, and then it turns out that there's another property called supermodularity, which is not quite mathematically equivalent to complementarity, but if the support over which the arguments of the function can be written as the cross product of completely ordered sets, they are, uh, uh, 
equivalent, and I, uh, I have yet to see any example where that's violated, so <laughs> where, where they aren't equivalent, so uh, we can treat them as equal to each other. So what a supermodularity says, it says if I've got these two vectors, if I rearrange things, so I took the maxes element by element, uh, lo location by location of one vector and the mins of the other, that would produce more than if I, with the initial, uh, if, if I didn't do that. Uh, that's strict supermodularity. All right, now the intuition again is extremely simple. All it's saying is that if you're trying to maximize total something, if the marginal products are increasing in, in these arguments for each in isolation, you stick them together and they collectively do more than the uh, than what's lost by the fact that the lower values of the same thing are, are matched with each other. All right. So why do I make why would I even spend time on this? Because that's the Becker marriage model. In other words, Becker marriage model asks the following question, which was suppose that uh, all males have a scalar attribute and all females have a scalar attribute and it turns out each marriage produces something that's a function of the male attribute and the, f and the female attribute. Uh, one question I could ask is what would a social planner do? What would maximize total uh, family output? And the answer is everything depends on the function of uh, whether or not phi is or is not exhibiting complementarities. And so really by definition from the equivalence of supermodularity and complementarity, since M and W are scalars and assumed therefore to be completely ordered, with complementarity the efficient outcome is to match the highest M and the highest W, second highest M, second highest W, so on and so forth. So one thing just to note is that the pow one of the powers of supermodularity is a lot of these efficiency of a sort of matching arguments immediately derive from it. It becomes apparent that all the continuity assumptions in Becker, they didn't matter. Number of agents didn't matter. There could have been 75 agents, so on and so forth. All right, and so one reason to read the, again, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what's, what you've been taught, but the reason you want to be familiar with the more abstract work on supermodularity and complementarity is it, is it gives you a much richer context uh, for analyzing uh, when a sort of matching has some efficiency property. Now, I talked about efficiency. Uh, so there was a social planner. This sounds very evil. Uh, and in other words, that there was a, somebody who was actually deciding who marries who. I think we want to rule that one out. And so it's natural to ask a question about equilibria. Okay, and, this, and this is really the point I simply want to put on the table. And this is where the transferable, non-transferable utility becomes an important idea. So then what Becker does, and this is you know, certain, is to say that the thing that the marriage produces is going to be split between the two parties. And, uh, and so the upshot is what you can show is in the presence of complementarity, when agents on their own choose their matches, and notice that really is a club. <laughs> Nobody gets to force you to get divorced. Uh, uh, except yourself by acting like a jerk, I guess. But <laughs> the, uh, the, the upshot's the following, and that is that within, you would get a strict disorder of matching, and it would be supported by bargaining within the uh, marriage in terms of splitting the, the product of the marriage. Okay. So this is a particular interest in the following sense, that in this very admittedly desiccated model, and after all, if we thought the output of the marriage had something to do with the kids, but I'm going to get to that in a second, that, that becomes intergenerational mobility. That is a sort of matching. Notice something. The efficient outcome and the equilibrium outcome have the following feature. They maximize the total output of the marriages. They also maximize inequality. I said, what's, of all the configurations of matching men and women in the Becker marriage model, which one maximizes the gap between the output of the highest <laughs> output family and the lowest output family? It's the equilibrium one and the efficient one. Okay, so in my view, that's about as good a equity efficiency trade-off as I can think of because it is intrinsic to the logic of the analysis and it doesn't depend on uh, the fact that we call them M and W which is an outcome of the idea that, that there's some sort of matching process that's generating outcomes for everybody. Okay, so I wanted to have an uh, equity efficiency idea on the table. So that's comment number one. Here's comment number two. I'm sorry she's not here because uh, you won't be shocked to hear that the way that if we thought of the output of the marriage as something called a baby, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think we have a Solomonic solution to the, uh, uh, the bargaining problem, do we? Okay, the serious point is that in many contexts, 
the matching does not have transferable utility. So let's just do the extreme case, no transferable utility. Uh, I, you just missed this very profound insight that both parents enjoy the baby equally. They don't get to split the amount of pleasure, <laughs> let alone split the baby. Okay, but think about what my neighborhood, the neighborhood's model did. It had exactly the same thing. It said everybody's a member of the neighborhood, but conditional on that, there's equal benefits from neighborhood membership. Okay, so these are what I'm calling non-transferable utility ideas, obviously in a very applied context. Regardless of complementarity in those models, you still, as an equilibrium, get a sort of matching. In other words, let's suppose that the, okay, so the new world is the, pr the product of the, ba of the marriage is, is not some stuff that the husband and wife split, it's a baby, and they both get equal utility from it. You might, in my deranged uh, eugenicist uh, mindset, I say, oh, I have an optimal allocation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, husbands and wives. That won't be the equilibrium. The equilibrium is the highest M and W. They, they don't give a damn about the social efficiency. They only care about maximizing the quality of the thing they produce together. And so here's a case where if you actually had markets or you were, had transferable utility, it might reduce inequality. Okay, just something to think about. Okay, it's a, it's a simple model, you know, it's one I'm sure you've all studied, but I think it's useful to think about equity efficiency trade-offs and its relationship to the efficiency of stratification, and then to ask about what, you know, why separable versus uh, transferable, excuse me, and non-transferable utility actually can matter here. So you can see that in, remember this is, and this is in some level kind of intuitive, What's happening in the environments in which you, you aren't pricing things, i.e. via bargaining, is there's, there's a public goods aspect or an externality aspect. And so that creates additional uh, a force towards se segregation, stratification, and a force towards inequality. All right, uh, I'm, how am I doing on time badly? So if you look in the lecture notes, there's a detailed discussion of cases of how to extend the Becker efficiency results to firms in which there's actually different categories of workers. Uh, there's a case where it turns out the Becker result fails, and that is if uh, firms can have different sizes. I guess if marriages could have different, if polygamy were allowed, you actually wouldn't get uh, efficient strat stratification, wouldn't even be efficient under complementarity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I also go through the notes and description of the relations between complementarity and multiple equilibria. Uh, why would one do that? Because in an abstract model, multiple equilibria might have something to do with poverty traps. And so uh, uh, I'm going to skip all of that. Then I go, again, self-serving. I'm going to go through a, there's a discrete choice model of social interactions. It's exactly the same form of Larry's uh, uh, evolutionary game theory work on logia, but it's di Larry's is dynamic. This was focusing on multiple self-consistent equilibria. Okay, but we're going to skip all of that because it's, and uh, everything's shown to be generalized. But I want to spend the last 15 minutes on this. Where, where we are, I hope, is perspective number one was income. Family investment, private, these non-interacting dynasties gave us a vision of intergenerational immobility. Second perspective is simply to really couch the Heckman lectures in an intergenerational mobility language and to make an argument that it's sufficiently, it should be regarded as a, as a distinct theory of inequality. Third idea was that once we, in, in social context, the action, so to speak, is going to be on some notion of stratification and then the, the social influences become the carriers of inequality and the generation of the immobility. Final thing is I want to now make some comments about genetics. And uh, there's, uh, uh, an extraordinarily large literature on efforts to try to identify the role of genes in socioeconomic outcomes. Okay, when I use the phrase socioeconomic outcomes, I mean that very broadly. I'm including things like measurements of IQ uh, and the like. And so since uh, one thing we do know uh, parents, uh, <laughs> as I said, we know that parents do pass their genes on to their kids. If genes matter for something, then that might tell us something about the sources of inequality. Now, by way of background, what was emphasized on Monday was the distinction between genes and the environment is, uh, is problematic. It's problematic at two levels. One of them is, the, as we'll see, the algebra by which people have tried to assess the role of genes is typically uh, uh, ignoring that they are interactive, I mean literally rules it out. 
And second, the whole notion that the DNA is, produces the person is actually, as a matter of, uh, of, of biology, incorrect. The DNA may be the blueprint, but it's the triggers that determine the uh, actual building of the house. An environment can alter the, uh, the triggering process, and that is now known as epigenetics. All right. So what I want to do is uh, sort of uh, now explain to you, on the other hand, if you sort of, you know, you, what, what do people say? They say, oh yeah, half of, half of uh, IQ's genes, half's environment. That's the sort of thing you see in a newspaper. Or they'll say it's 80% genes and 20% environment. And the question is, well, how did somebody come up with these numbers? Were they, I mean, and as I said, you know, there's thousands and thousands of papers doing these calculations for a whole host of socioeconomic measurements that are, that are assessing these things. And so, uh, uh, you know, another claim you see is that, uh, you know, roughly speaking, it's half genes, it's half family, and it's not the family environment conditional on genes doesn't matter, and the rest is go to idiosyncratic. That's the Judith Rich Harris uh, uh, perspective. So the question is, well, what's the there there? I mean, people didn't make these numbers up. They were, so, were social scientists, I suppose natural scientists as well, that were analyzing data and doing calculations that came to these conclusions. So the way to understand the, the literature, and this is this, what's called the ACE model, it's very elementary. It basically says the following, there's some outcome of interest, I'm looking across individuals, and the, uh, there's gonna be three factors that determine the, uh, the outcome. The first is gonna be something called A, it's a genetic component, and in the analysis, it's a scalar. Now you might say that's okay, just think of it as a weighted average of a bil billions of genes, but nevertheless, there's a scalar is the object that's stuck in the model. The second object is called shared or family environment. It's C, it's another scalar, and its property is two siblings, or two individuals that grow up in the same household must have the same value of C. All right, that's what makes it a family environment. The third is E, and that's the idiosyncratic or non-shared environment. That's the stuff that just happens to you that uh, isn't correlated with your siblings or your, and wasn't generated by, uh, by your, uh, your, your the, the, this mysterious A object. So that, those are the variables which, with which one works. And you could say automatically we're in, we're in terrible trouble. Because the only thing that in principle is measured at this point is omega. That's the outcome. We have data on the outcomes. The, Classical literature is driven entirely by latent variable analysis. In other words, the, uh, because they're latent variables, we think of those three things. I can normalize the variances to be one. That's without loss of generality. And lo and behold, that is literally the model that is assumed. The assumption is that a socioeconomic outcome for agent I is determined as the sum of a genetic component, little a, multiplied by the latent variable, plus the shared family component, C, the coefficient C multiplied by the, 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 the family component and the same thing for the idiosyncratic. Now what the normalization is doing is it's telling us that the variances of the objects are one, so all the action is going to be with the coefficients. So a question you could put is, suppose I said to you this is my vision of what, how these factors determine socioeconomic outcomes. Okay. It's obviously with loss of generality because there is no gene environment interaction. Take the cross partial there, that's an easy one to calculate, it's zero. All right. Well, even under these very strong assumptions, the answer is I couldn't tell you anything. And, and again, the, and the reason is trivial. I have one variable, and I have three latent variables. How could I uh, say anything? So, how does this literature proceed? It takes two steps. The first step is the following, and that is it assumes that for each individual, three covariances are zero. There is no covariance between your genes and your family background. There's no covariance between your family background, uh, either your genes or your family background, and your idiosyncratic component. Okay, by ruling out those covariances, we got a huge simplification. And that is the variance of the outcome, which I can calculate. Remember, the omegas are observable. I know is equal to a squared plus c squared plus e squared. Yes? 
A is the, okay, remember they're thinking in kind of a somewhat crude fashion. You were born with A, that's the genes. E is what happened to you, the luck. So if you walked home from school one day and you got beaten up, that's, a, that's part of E. That's just bad luck and as a result, you're gonna behave differently. You know, take a, get, get a black belt in karate or uh, if you're from where I'm from, you buy a gun. Okay. <laughs> so it's supposed to be some, something about the idiosyncrasies of experience. So lo and behold, we got this huge simplification, and that is uh, the variance equals the, uh, the sum of those. Okay, so even somebody as good as math as Larry Bloom cannot give me a unique solution to, the, uh, to this. I'm afraid we've got three unknowns and one, <laughs> one, 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 one observable. I want to emphasize all this work on twins maintains these assumptions. So what's happening is you make these assumptions that reduce down the complexity of the problem because all the covariance terms are not unobservables that matter for the overall variance of the outcome. They're all zero, so that's good. But nevertheless, I still have three objects left. So uh, that's also assumed. So how, how, how are we going to proceed? So the answer, and this is what the literature does, is it, it thinks about two things. One, the distinction between separated, uh, between dizygotic and monozygotic twins. I assume you've only got one, uh, so you're not having to worry about this. And so that's just the difference between fraternal and identical twins. The assumption in the literature, unsurprising, okay, is that the identical twins have identical A's. And as Jim mentioned, that's actually not quite right. Uh, and then the second assumption is that the, um, of course, that the, the dizygotic twins, the, co the, the covariance, the correlation is 0.5 between the, uh, the A's of the two agents, of the two individuals. So that's going to be the first thing to exploit. The second thing to exploit is whether twins are raised together or separately. So this is like the, you know, th th thing that people are dying to get their hands on are data of identical twins raised in separate households. And so the idea is that, well, obviously the genes are the genes in this view. And then you can sort of parse out something about the role of the environment by looking at these two genetically identical objects in different environments. Which I shouldn't have skipped that. That's a very important slide. That's also assumed. In other words, all the cross relationships between individuals, are, there's no covariance. So in other words, if I looked at uh, you know, just two individuals in the population, there's by assumption, no covariance in their uh, genetics, blah, blah, blah. But it's only when I focus on twins that I get to violate the, uh, these types of assumptions. OK, so why is this going to be so useful? Answer, because these types of calculations can now be done. Suppose that I have two identical twins, and they've both been adopted. Everybody with me? So identical twin lives in this family, not the birth parents. The other one lives in this family, not the birth parents. Under the assumptions of all these covariances being equal to zero, the variance of the difference between them, well, it can't be driven by the genes because they're identical by assumption. It's just this, the other two components. So there's a C squared for each of them. So the difference is two C squared with respect to the environment. And there's a two E squared with respect to the genetics. So if I had data on, on monozygotic twins that are both that are separated, I could calculate that second variance term. So I had the first variance term, that just whatever the variance of the object of interest is. I now have a variance term that's conditional on separated monozygotic twins. We're getting closer to uh, employing that machinery up, up there. Now we've got three, two, three unknowns and two equations. It turns out that that's sufficient to identify, even though I can't tell you all three, I could actually tell you one of them, and that's the, that's the role of the genes. And so that basically just go through a calculation and you can determine what that is. So that would be one approach. The second would simply be to, uh, to look at dizygotic and monozygotic twins that are raised together. And so why would identical twins be different if they're raised together? The only thing that they can differ with respect to is those E's, the idiosyncratic components. Your identical twin didn't get uh, walked down that street that day. So the variance of the difference between those two has to be 2E squared. Well, obviously, if I divide both sides by 2, lo and behold, E squared is identified. 
So, okay, so we're done with E. Then the second question I could th thing I could ask is, tell me what happens if I look at dizygotic twins that are raised together? Yes. The unconditional variances of the E's is every, remember that's IID across every person in the world, including the two twins. Even though they have potentially shared genetic material because they share parents? That's been, well, remember the only difference, that's ruled out. It's identi the assumption is identical twins raised by the same parents, the genetic component cancels out, so the difference can't be affected by that. That's the linearity assumption. Second aspect. Identical family, if they were raised by the same, same family, same input of C. That cancels out. The only thing that's left over are the E's. Okay. We'll criticize the assumption in a second. That's what the literature does. I'm, this one, I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. All right, do the, exactly the same calculation for dizygotic twins. What's going to be the difference? Obviously, the E's have to stay there. But because there's only a 0.5 overlap, the variation, there will be variation in the genes between them and so you get a squared. So now I have three equations and three unknowns, I'm done. So lo and behold, that's it. And so these are, as I said, this is kind of, you know, a little bit of, I, you know, you see claims about this in the pop literature. So the question is, should you believe results like this? I mean, are they credible? You know, so people disagree on that, and, but. That's the fraction of the variance of the outcome that's determined by genes. Remember, the variance of the outcome is little a squared plus little c squared plus little e squared. If I can identify them, I get to say this fraction of variance in IQ is determined by genes. This fraction of IQ is de determined by shared environment, the family. And this fraction is determined by the idiosyncrasies of the life course. Now, you brought up the first issue. The talk about variance contributions is not meaningful unless I actually have orthogonal objects to begin with. So in other words, if I say to you the variance of something is the variance of contribution of this plus this plus this, some of the variance, variance of the sum equality actually assumed all the covariances were zero. That's why I made a big deal about that. In other words, even before we looked at the twins data, there was a vision of the relationships between these objects that was necessary in order to talk about a variance decomposition. For those of you that have studied vector autoregressions, I assume Princeton, you do that still. Uh, when you want to sort of ask about the component of the monetary shock to overall output, what's the first, what do you have to do? You have to orthogonalize the errors in the, in the, uh, in the, in the time series vectors in, in order to be able to talk about variance contributions. Well, this did it simply by fiat. It just said, I assume, the assumption is that all these covariants are zero. So, Let's think about those. What about this assumption? The idea that genes in the environment, or the family environment is uncorrelated with the person's genes. Is this, is this assumption sensible? I claim that it actually is an, it's untenable because it, in my mind, it creates a logical inconsistency with the exercise. So let, let me just uh, explain. To say that my genes are uncorrelated with my, the family environment, well, since my genes are correlated with my parents, I was going to have to mean that my family environment's uncorrelated with my parents' genes, which I guess means that uh, genes don't matter for the, fam the decisions parents make with respect to family environment. So it seems to me that I already assumed that a squared equals zero. Okay, so, but the serious point is this one is a first order non credible assumption. In fact, I could set a squared equal to zero, relax that assumption, and say the purpose of the exercise was to come up with the uh, covariance of those two things. Please. So that's the level at which this, the identification is completely contingent on an implausible assumption. So uh, I guess we're just going, and, and this sort of goes back to my question, is there an implicit assumption on the covariance of AI and AI? Yes. AI, if you're identical, they, it's 1 and it's 0.5 if, it's, if you're if fraternal. Well, that, that one, I think you would have, I, I think that you, I wouldn't say the literature fails because of that assumption. The fact that they are literally one and 
Th that one, uh, I don't think so. You don't win the debate on that one, though. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a good argument. But this one, the problem is that if you relax that assumption, the data, and I simply said there is a covariance between the two, because I think that my parents' genes probably had some effect on the environment that they raised. Or maybe the parents knew about my genetic characteristics and chose the environment in response. Once you allow for those factors, I could set A squared equal to zero. So there is no genetic role. So that's the level at which the assumption drives the conclusion. And I think this is the one, you know, th this is the one I think it's easiest to, to criticize. <coughs> Okay, now, yes, you asked a different question, which uh, Colin, uh, James Best, and uh, JJH are working on, which is how to convert this into an intergenerational regression. So what I'm trying to say is that um, my genes do not, do not come from um, my father's genes. They also come from my mother's genes. And then the question goes down to how did my father meet my mother? Or yeah, but that, that's not a, sure. But the, the only but the only argument you want the only point there is when you go intergenerational, you need to account for that. Remember, once I go intergenerational, I have more data. I have other moments to compute. Okay, so I, that's not going to be a source of an, of a, an inconsistency. Um, your question, the way I want to phrase it, is how would I turn this into a uh, IGE model? And uh, Colin, I, and two others hopefully will have an answer in a, in a week. Please. No, that's a very good point. Uh, it turns out that the decompositions depend on, within the United States, depend on the socioeconomic status of the family. You get different values for these things, and that by itself is very serious. Second comment we just to make, it turns out that this separated twins data has less than meets the eye. Uh, in other words, the most common person to raise a set twin that's not a birth parent is the sibling of a birth parent. And, uh, and so this assumption of uncorrelatedness in the variance of the family components across separated twins is also untenable. You know, and you know, when one could push harder. The first one to me wins the debate in the sense that that is so antithetical to how we reason as social scientists. I just don't don't see how we could take any of the results seriously. The second one, I don't have a good sense of the nature of the empirical uh, failure. All right, so point number one is I want you to see the literature as it exists really is based on what Chris Sims once called incredible identifying assumptions. They're incredible as in not credible. That's comment one. Comment two, as you may know, and let's put, I'm going to put it on the table, these types of arguments are sometimes used to make claims about blacks versus whites. And so every 20 years this argument resurfaces, most recently with the bell curve. What I want you to see, and so what, what, what people, and so if you look in the bell curve, not that I recommend you spend your time doing it, but it would say something to the effect that they think the black-white IQ gap has something to do with genes, something to do with the environment. Of course, they're scholars. They don't take extreme environmentalist or genetic positions. Uh, and then, you know, they'll, they'll make references to these types of studies. The comment I want to put on the table is the following, and that is these studies say nothing about the determinants of... Uh, of why there's an IQ gap between ethnic groups. It wouldn't matter if the number was 100. It wouldn't matter for genes. It wouldn't matter if it's zero. Now, why do I say that? These decompositions are about second moments. The issue of the black-white education gap, test score gap, whatever you want to call it, that's about first moments. So you really only have two ways you can go. Either you assume the same first moments or, uh, for all ethnic groups, in which case you've already assumed away any possibility of genes mattering, and so it's irrelevant. Or second, for each group you subtract off the mean. But since it was the mean difference we cared about to begin with, the exercise is logically irrelevant. Okay. And so I mean this quite seriously. All the claims about these types of decompositions speaking to the sources of observed gaps between ethnic groups they're off topic. 
moments because one's about first moments. That's the, the, the aggregate claim. This literature is about second moments. And I think for what it's worth, that seemed, I don't understand why that doesn't get more attention. Uh, but I mean, I put that on the table. This, this really you, is, a, is just a misunderstanding that there, there's no evidence that on, on a genetic component to the first moment differences. All right, so there are uh, various ways to try to extend the models. One thing you could do is, I actually had five moments and three unknowns, and so one could press that and try to then relax some of the covariance assumptions. A more interesting way to do it, I think, is, and Wallace Howe, a student of mine at Wisconsin, and I are pursuing that to sort of see how far you can go. Uh, Gabriella, who spoke on Monday, and, and Heckman, I've also have, have some idea of looking at uh, using like multiple measurements in, in personality tests to, uh, to getting over identifying restrictions. Uh, let me just make a couple of comments to, because I'm running out of time about epigenetics. Uh, Everything I said so far was this classical model, nevertheless, where this idea is that you have these additive components. And so where the action is in genetics, as in medical genetics, as well as behavioral genetics, uh, is, to is to get away from this idea that, that, they're, that they're additive objects. In other words, to allow for interactions. Within the uh, behavioral genetics literature, I don't want to be, well, maybe I do want to be obnoxious. There are these very mechanical ways to allow for gene environment interactions. I write down an, an ACE model that might be A times C, A plus C plus E plus M times uh, A plus M times C, and M is supposed to be this third observable that's the environment. And so these are very mechanical, and I don't, they suffer from every problem I've talked about before. The epigenetics is, is, is of particular interest because there's evidence about this with respect to humans, and this is one of the, the famous case, which was, uh, I, don't, I assume was in the lecture notes, but I don't, was not mentioned on Monday, and that is at the end of the Second World War when the Germans left the Netherlands, they destroyed all the food or took it with them, and so there was a brief famine, and researchers subsequently went to find out what happened to the children that were in utero during the famine and other things equal, they tended to be overweight. So the question is, and, and there's an epigenetic explanation for that, and that is that in utero development, the genetic triggers are influenced by the mother's environment. And so if the mother is in a calorie-deprived environment, the genetic triggers metaphorically will make the offspring have a sweet tooth, as an example. In other words, crave calories more. And so what happened was that the trigger occurred during this high frequency or low, low, this rare event, which was the famine, but then the children grew up in a different environment. And you can sort of see the evolutionary explanation, which is as, as these features were in, you know, developing in, in Homo sapiens, probably there was a, a lot of persistence in uh, low calorie environments because it would be associated with the climate. Whereas uh, in our august uh, advance to modern civilization, we can create them uh, overnight. And so that's actually in medical literature known as the mismatch hypothesis, which is that we evolved to have certain traits which are v unhealthy uh, because they, they really don't apply to uh, uh, the environments in which, uh, in which we emerged, which you know, are typically dated around 50,000 years ago. All right, so uh, the only, what I want to say is that um, uh, we don't know, very little is known about this for humans, but there's an extraordinarily disturbing result, which Gabriella referred to. And that is that th there are experiments that demonstrate transgenerational epigenetic effects. So metaphorically, you starve a mouse while it's pregnant. The offspring of, you know, is, tends to overeat, but even worse, even though the next generation, you have the same effect. So in other words, the genetic triggers seem to possibly cascade across generations. This may be important. Who know? Nobody knows at this point, but that would say that if you have population of people that are subject to centuries of disadvantage, there could be health consequences that, uh, that don't reverse after a generation. And so that's just something we have to think about. Final comment I want to make, and I'm sorry I'm going a little bit late, is about so-called gene-wide asso association studies. Where the frontier is emerging in behavioral genetics is to say, well, 21st century technology, we can observe the genome. And so data sets such as the Wisconsin Longitudinal Survey are collecting uh, blood samples so that you actually have data on genes. 
And so, you know, periodically papers are beginning to appear in economics and other social sciences claiming that some gene's been found to correlate with, uh, I don't know, liberalism, I think was the most wild one in a paper, et cetera. What the, and, uh, and, and so what you're beginning to see are arguments, in fact, there a, was a paper that called it genoeconomics emerging, and it's the use of these so-called GWAS studies to identify genes that are correlated with socioeconomic outcomes. And so the, uh, the big advance conceptually would be it's no longer a latent variable, it's actually data. The mathematical complication is that obviously if I'm sort of looking for across many, many, many genes, random variations, some of them would be significant. And of course, and so that leads the literature on, uh, on basically adjusting large numbers of hypothesis tests for false positives. And so that's a, you know, that, that, that's a well understood thing from the genetics literature. What I want to say is the following. And that is uh, the GWAS literature, as we speak, has hit a huge barrier, a profound limitation. It has been a success in identifying particular genes that are associated with diseases or, you know, or, or you know, disorders such as Huntington's disease. It has been a complete failure to do something such as identify the genes associated with tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is known as quote unquote a complex disease. In other words, it's not one gene that if it's, you know, there's a particular mutation, you get tuberculosis. It's rather uh, going to be some combination, some complex of genes that would make you have a higher proclivity, and then given the environment that you're in, it may or may not get expressed. The problem intuitively is there's a computation, you know, as great as computers may be in 2013, there are deep computational limitations to identifying gene complexes. So like the frontier is to find pairs of genes that predict something. And so medical geneticists, this, this is what they're you know, working on, is how to identify genetic markers for more complex diseases. They have powerful uh, uh, aids in the sense they, uh, in doing this, they do know things about areas of the genome which are associated with, 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 with uh, polymorphisms that can be associated with the diseases just as some behavioral people working in behavioral gen uh, genetics are trying to look at parts of the, uh, the DNA code where they are known to be associated with serotonin levels. But nevertheless, there is this deep computational barrier. And so that you should be aware of that. And in fact, in, in medical genetics, there's something called the missing heritability problem. <laughs> you know, if you sort of look at certain diseases run in families, they can't find the genes that are running in the families because they're complicated, uh, they're complexes versus uh, simple things. Final comment, so this is just my opinion, is that, um, and this is linking up with the end of Larry's lecture, he mentioned something called emergence, this idea that there's properties that you describe at higher levels of aggregation than, than the things you start with. Well, that's quite natural to think about something as in, like intelligence, leaving aside whether it's a vector or a scalar, whatever it is, the idea that there's intelligence genes is nonsense. In other words, you would think there's very you know, complicated configurations that would lead to, to something such as intelligence. Or I said liberalism is apparent again, so I get by implication conservative political views. To the extent they have a genetic, there's an attribute associated with them. These are going to be emergent properties. There's no language in the GWAS studies for thinking about emergence. And one of the things that's you know, going to be problematic is it moves beyond saying it's a complex of genes. If you think about emergence, there's going to be very disparate configurations could generate the same higher order property. So again, I think that this is all potentially extremely interesting. Well, I mean, my point was not to say don't read about it or, or not, but just to recognize that right now uh, we're, we're not at the stage where one can make credible claims off the GWAS studies with respect to socioeconomic uh, outcomes. Progress has certainly been made on aspects of health but uh, one should be aware the medical genetics literature itself is, is confronting this complication that, of, of, of how to find genetic uh, footprints for, for complicated phenomena. All right, let me stop there.